Hello everyone and welcome to the Navin Times Talk from the Heart. Our guest today is Karuna Nandi, an advocate at the Supreme Court of India. She is in the Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people of 2022. It is a pleasure to introduce you to her and to be speaking with her. Hello Karuna and welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. The Supreme Court of India has a very wide jurisdiction. And to make laws that suit everyone, I suppose it's not, it's not easy. So, according to you, in your opinion, to what extent should the Supreme Court have that kind of power to make uh, laws? So, the Supreme Court doesn't make law. The Parliament and the state legislatures make law. So, the Goa Assembly makes laws mm -hmm. and the, the Lok Sabha makes laws, right? because they have been elected to make law. What the Supreme Court does is it says that where fundamental rights have been violated, right? So even where our elected representatives have failed to protect our most basic rights, even if one person's most basic right is violated, then they can go to the constitutional courts, be it the high courts or like the Goa uh, bench or the Goa bench of the Bombay High Court or the Supreme Court. And you can ask the court, you can tell the court that, look, my fundamental right has been violated. And yes, that the legislature has failed to protect my fundamental rights. And yes, say I am uh, in a very, very small minority of one. It's just me. You're right. Say it's my right to have green hair. Say, uh, say a law has been passed that all green-haired people should be put in jail, right? Or yellow-haired people, or whatever. Okay. It is, right. Right. Then, I have a right to go to the court and say that the reason the Constitution of India exists is to protect my right against that majoritarianism or the failure of parliament okay. and that is why our constitution is such a beautiful and noble thing and this is why the jurisdiction of our supreme court and our high courts is is such an important part of our constitutional democracy Right. You have spoken in many interviews about your love for the Constitution, and that's so admirable. Now, um, Karuna, with the number of cases that come your way, you must be like bombarded with cases. How do you decide which ones to choose, which ones to take, and what tilts the balance? There are a number of axes. One is that I have to feel that I can partner with this client, because my clients are my partner. So I have to feel that I can fully have faith in the case and stand by these particular clients and put every because I we you know my chamber not just me but me and my my colleagues my team we put when we take a case we put everything through. All right. Right. We work incredibly. When necessary, we uh, we ignore our families. We. Um, burn the midnight oil we, doesn't matter what you know and we, we really we put everything i can imagine of course so if we are going to do that if uh, and you know it's i take the decision but it's very i take my team's input very seriously it has to be a client that i can stand by and stand with so whether it is a rape victim or whether it is um a company, the principle is really the same in that right. sense. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, the second thing is that if it's a pro bono case, then and if it's a it's a rights case, then I think that there are two things come to the picture. One is that what is the because you know we there's so much. Unfortunately, there's a whole sea of people out there who need help. And you know, then the question is that how many people will 
this particular case help you? So if it's impact litigation, and if you're looking at changing a law or establishing a right that will help all our Indian citizens, then that will always take preference over the case of an individual person. Because that is the case of that individual person, unless it's a precedent setting case, will be something that will only help them. Right. right? So basically what you're saying uh, is that you're, you, you look at cases where based on impact, how impactful it is. How impact, how impact. Yes, right. So simply put. Yes. And the third thing is that um, if it's a commercial case, I mean, you know, fees come into the picture. So can they afford one? Because those are at, you know, our, our normal fees are, uh, you know, reflective of what you right. Yes, yes. So, um, so there's that. Um, so that, that, you know, I never close close my mind or my doors to anything unforeseen that would make me excited about a case. I love my work and I love the law. And uh, yeah, things might come up that don't fit into the box. Yeah, it shows that you love the law. Now, you have been called a feminist superhero. Okay, you have done so much for women, for you know, for those who have been treated badly. What do you think are some of the reforms that still need to to be made, especially for women, you know, some that will benefit women? Now, most in our country, most of the women are poor, they are illiterate, they don't know, you know, what their rights are. So what are some reforms you feel that should come into play? Oh, so many, Maria. I think that the top priority should really be for the central governments and state governments to take the laws that are most important um, that deal with women's rights. For example, the prevention of sexual harassment to set up the local area committees so that if the workplace committee is biased, which they sometimes are, then you can go to your local area committee the government set up, right. you know, tribunal that has nothing to do with your companies. Um, that the criminal laws are funded. What do I mean by that? That you have the police sitting down with representatives of the judiciary, with um, people in the education system, the education departments, um, with the, you know, with the, the public works departments, for building new buildings, where it's necessary. To make this a reality, this is what I need. Maybe I need more police people. I need to recruit on the basis of not just uh, how tall are you and how broad are you, mm -hmm. but also on the basis of what is your ability to uphold constitutional values, right? Maybe I need more people. Maybe I need more women and queer folk in my um, police force. Maybe I need to uh, train them and maybe I need to set in place and so we also need the law department there. Maybe I need to also tweak the rules to reflect the fact that I will not just promote you on the basis of the cases that you have solved, you know, thereby incentivizing just uh, catching someone and putting that court mm -hmm. in um, jail, but also in terms of how did I uphold the constitutional values. Like, did I just go and round up couples sitting, you know, in a park or, uh, you know, in front of the, in front of the Duari River? Exactly. Did I round them up and take them to the police station? And lock them up. I, or did I, uh, did I say, did I stop someone from beating up a, a trans individual? So I think there are many, many things to do. I think governments need to set up shelters. Because if a woman needs to leave her home and um, set up a new life, right? Our patriarchal society, sometimes the parents will support. And I think Goa is a little better than other places in India. If it's yes, but, true. But sometimes the parents will support and sometimes they won't, you know. Um, and if the woman hasn't been working, then it's a difficult situation. Where she, where she would live? She has children, that's even harder. Then the incentive to leave, the incentive to keep being beaten, and trying to put a brave face on it is much greater. 
right? Correct. So therefore, I think for government-supported shelters that are nice places, that are pleasant enough places where you can stay until you get on your feet, you know, and get some training and not that same embroidery tailoring. I mean, you know, whatever embroidery tailoring gets in store, but Correct. everyone doesn't want to do embroidery tailoring. And frankly, there's that much space in the market. Right. And the nari nikhil are definitely not good. <laughs> okay. So another another point. Um, a question that I would like to ask because I think, uh, like you said, in Goa we are much uh, better off than other states. But what about property rights for women? What do you have to say about it? What are the reforms that need to come in there? See, these are to a significant succession in uh, what religion you come from, right? Mm -hmm. And so, for example, we, there's the case that uh, under the Hindu Succession Act, you know. Speaking of, because even in Goa, of course, there's, you know, the majority of your population is Hindu. And the Hindu Succession Act, there's an illusion that the amendment of 2005, which said that girls will inherit equally from boys, uh, equally as boys, um, removed the patriarchy from that act. And it didn't. Because the thing is that if a woman is too, if a woman dies, then where does her property go? So her property at the first instance, if it doesn't go to her children, etc., will actually go to her husband's family. Now, what if it's self-acquired property, right? right? What if the property came from, do you know what I mean? Like, it's just, right. it doesn't make sense. So, all of these things, then there's this distinction between agnet and common, which is just, it's all very archaic, coming from the Mitakshara and Dayapaga systems of families. That is really, mm -hmm. like, it's all aging from it's not right. that you don't see reflections in current day society, but according to me, it's not in accordance with post constitutional, post independence India. So I think all of that needs to be reformed, and it's, it's very clear. So, uh, what of course, are, in Goa, you have your own um, some state laws which are quite progressive. So, for example, giving a certain amount to uh, a certain flat amount to women every month, you know. And this was a huge debate on, uh, and, you know, nationally, and people were thinking angry, very upset about it. Whereas, of course, you all have been doing it for a few years. Yes. Um, in the anti um, anti rape laws that you have helped to reform, what is, you think, the biggest change that has come in? I think the biggest change is that the the expansion of the definition of rape. And that's the biggest change, uh, and that is on the cards from before. But I, was, but I think uh, another very, very significant one is Section 166A, which requires police, police officers to register rape cases on pain of pay, a penal law. What does that uh, mean in layman's terms? So what happens is that if somebody has been sexually assaulted, somebody has been raped, and you go right. to a police officer, you go to the local police station, and you say that this happened, they have to register the FIR, and if they don't, they themselves can be prosecuted criminally. Right. For not registering the FIR. That's a right. But do you see that law has been passed? But do you see that happening, or is it just on paper? And you know that's about it. So very much on paper, but the fact that it exists means that it has been used by my team um, to make sure that cases are registered. Okay. Fine. I mean not. I'm, I say by my team, also by many, many others. But I'm saying by my team because, you know, that I can tell you for sure, it's not just data. Mm -hmm. And also, I encourage anyone who's watching this to remember that section, section 166A, because it applies to uh, rape cases, but also other kinds of cases of sexual assault um, uh, and other crimes against women. So, if there is such a crime against you and they're not registering the FIR, so I think to remember that section is very important. So, th does this also refer to sexual harassment at work or or at any other place as well? Or does it only apply to rape? No, it refers to sexual harassment. See, the thing to remember that sexual harassment at work is not just, is not not sexual harassment as a crime. So, that section is very important because you always have the option to go to the criminal law if you're not satisfied, right? 
so it includes so for example if somebody has touched you in an inappropriate way and if there's sexual assault then that is something that uh, you can complain about if there's words or gestures that outrage your modesty under section 509 then you can go and say that look please register my fir and if they don't register your fir then it will be a um, it will be a criminal offense for them not to register that fir so it applies to also other crimes that i just mentioned now the the legal age for marriage has been increased from 18 to 21 Yes. Do you see this positively or do you think it's going to bring a lot of restrictions on women on girls you know once this happens Look I think the major response is that it's a positive thing but I actually think that it will drive a lot of this practice on the ground right and it might take away significant rights from women and I think women groups that deal with this are very right. much against it. so there's that I think they are the ones who have the experience with dealing with with the the DTT context. So they have to listen to very carefully. Correct, because you know now it's going to be the parents are going to have much more say. Uh, the village council and so on in the rural areas going to have much more say and say no, it's not, it's not to be done. Now, uh, the Indian judiciary still remains majorly a, a man's world, and um, for you. as an advocate of the supreme court how do you manage this imbalance what what is it that you do what is it this um attitude that you go with that helps you you know it's less so now i'm so pleased to say because oh nice i think yes i know because i think there are um important members of the court system that are really pushing to make the judiciary more uh, representative of society, you know of the of uh, the reflection of the demographic and demographics of society but at the same time it's true that uh, it it's not a fast process right. and i think that for me personally you know these things keep changing so i mean your questions are very uh, are very insightful and uh, require reflection okay because it goes it also keeps changing right i think in any case one must connect to one bench and then work through logic through facts you know and through the interaction that is the back and forth to attempt to bring the bench towards one's own case right that's mm-hmm. here now there is additional work required if the bench is very different from if the bench is a different gender from a different region from a different world view right um a different type of legal education a different set of heuristics yes. different way of thinking right correct um, so all of that actually plays in and that of course is the challenge now what i feel um and so i think that looking at all of that and attempting to and that is something that in our preparation we actually address you know i mm-hmm. i look at these things and i consider these things because i think these things are relevant and that plays into how one communicates and i think what people forget in the law is that it's also you know the job is of persuasion Correct. Right. Now, how you persuade is a matter of precedent. How much law you've got and what your facts are. Like these are the things right. that are fixed. Right. Right. What you bring to the table is how you understand. And, I mean, it was how you gather together everything. That's very important, but also that's the basic that is required. But everyone can't do it as well as the next person. Right. But how you present it to the court and how you connect with your decision maker and and how you're able to think out of the box when necessary to bring those right answers from the rich body of law that's already been established right it's a challenge it's, it's a and it's hard work it's a challenge yes it is hard work <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure now you have worked 
with the United Nations, you have worked uh, in America and other countries, of course. How is it different from working here? What is it that we have that is so advantageous uh, compared to, of course, each country must be having something that's really positive about, you know, their system. But what is it in India that we have and which is something that is unique to us? I think that our constitutional courts have, have quite wide jurisdictions, you know. All right. So that is something that uh, can be quite exciting when you're doing constitutional cases. Right? I like that at a particular level here, like if you look at Fahmi Nariman, if you look at, you know, Marie Salve, who actually now chose to choose spend a lot of time in uh, other jurisdictions. Um, if you look at if you look at sort of the the top litigators, mm -hmm. they uh, they don't specialize really, you know. And I think that for me is a huge pro because uh, I don't believe in specialization. And I've done tax litigation and criminal litigation and telecom litigation and. Uh, of course, constitutional litigation. And then, you, of course, you develop much deeper expertise in particular truth. But, and you might need the kind of, at the initial stages, right, from reaching down to the kind of, say, deep expertise in, you know, when we were doing the Patreon case, we brought on board the, you know, somebody, um, Ruchira Guer, who has deep expertise in te telecom, right? Okay. Um, to brief me and to bring me up to speed at on, on particular issues and um, and to make sure that nothing is missed and then you take that and then you um, and and I love not specializing. <laughs> I love not having to specialize. Robert, which area do you find most challenging? I mean, I wouldn't say that it's on law. So I wouldn't say that any area is particularly difficult. I would say that there are some, there's work, there's, there are cases in some areas that you can do badly and get away with it. Like in, actually, ironically, in uh, rights litigation, right? Like you could put five newspaper articles together and say that this terrible thing has happened, my lord, that it violates articles 19, 14, and 21. Right. right. That is your case. And that is doing a case badly, in my opinion. Um, and then, but then you can also do it extremely well, because then you can take the specific facts and say that actually, here is a constitutional uh, uh, a constitutional bench judgment that occupies the field and so what's happening right now in this place needs to be addressed immediately and i need an interim order to protect my clients right now right, right? Um, and so you see the difference between the two approaches but the difference between a tax case done badly and a tax case done well is much more blatant, you know. Um, there's there, there's more startup work to do in a tax case, right? And this is why some people specialize because then they don't have to do startup work, right? Okay. So basically, yeah. what you're saying is from because you take this, you know, variety of cases, you know, all across the board, there is of course. A lot of research that goes in, there's a lot of study that goes in, but there's also a lot of learning, and that's what you find very interesting. Exactly, but also after uh, twenty years of doing this, right, you actually, and having the same approach. It's not that right. the approach has changed, you see, because also my first degree was in economics, and okay. through you know, through St. Stephen's and Cambridge and Columbia, I've always studied and learned all of these different aspects that I'm interested in, right? right? Right. So this approach is now, if you take law school, etc., is now, um, God, I'm old, uh, 27 years old. <laughs> okay. All right. Hang on, more than that. So 93 is when I joined college, right? So that's seven. It's 29 years old, this approach. My. 
and um, so I've been doing this stuff for 29 years. So which means that you then develop actually an expertise in all these different things. Yes. Right? Because, 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 you know? you know what are the areas that you now since you said you've done 29 years and you've reached that stage in you know in your life and your career what is it that now you look forward to that you want to do and you 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 are like i'm going to work towards that and you know i'm going to achieve it what is it i think i think i would like to fulfill the promise of my work so far and of the constitution of india not just with regard to fundamental rights, that is possibly the most important, but also with regard to access to justice and quick decision making and, um, you know, aiming, trying to get quick orders for clients. I think that's one aspect. I think in another, in a more process oriented way, I would like to do this from a space of calm and abundance and healing and that's very it sounds very spiritual yeah the healing and the and the the calm i mean calm is fine but that healing and you know that that sounds very spiritual you could say for example in the marital rape case you could say that all men are rapists and or no you know that these people are rapists and it's a, a women against men fight and um, uh, put it in a, you know, sort of approach it in a particular way. I think that is definitely not an approach, you know. Our approach is that, look, this is about people against patriarchy. Right. right? Patriarchy very much affects men as well as women. You know, this yes. is why men are standing with us. And this is why they are saying that we want our wives to be able to say a joyful yes. Because if they can't say a no, how can they say a joyful and equal yes? So I think even in these smaller ways, the approach that one takes um, reflects in what's going on. And it is spiritual because I think that when one is motivated by something larger than oneself, which is, which is justice and oneness and um, and taking, carrying our whole polity with us, you know? Right. Like taking our whole country forward um, and not just particular sections of it. Then and do you see that happening though? Do you see that happening? Um, in the country, well, you know, the way it's politics are going, absolutely not. But is that... You're hopeful. That, you're hopeful. Like we all are. You can't not be hopeful. If you're not hopeful, you're dead. <laughs> and it's just in what, in what timeline will, will the hope be realized? You know? Um, because as Martin Luther King said, said, the arc of the modern universe bends towards justice, right? And it's our work to keep that faith and to help bend it towards justice. So, um, I think you and your team are doing a wonderful job and I'm sure we are all with you from all of us here at the studio and from the Navin Times. May that arc bend more with your help towards justice for everyone. Thank you, Karuna, for joining us. It was wonderful speaking with you. And to all our viewers, thank you for your time, for your patience and for your attention. Until next time, bye from all of us here. Thank you again.